Now we have to study this equilibrium of pressures. Before I move forward, let me spend uh, a few additional words on the static assumptions that I, uh, static assumption that I made. You realize that this is not realistic. It's just a conceptual model that we use for studying uh, the shape of this interface. It's not realistic because uh, for the very reason that the sea is not static, but also it's not static because here also fresh water is not static. Because if we have rain for infiltration, of course we get more water here, water that wants to get into the sea. So it's not static. And uh, if we want to be very precise, uh, therefore, in the future, when we understood, uh, when we will have understood that this mechanism in static condition, if we want to be more realistic, we have to remove these assumptions. And uh, we have to remove the assumption of static system, and we have to remove the assumption that uh, the separation is a surface. So we have to build a more refined model. And this more refined model needs to be a groundwater model, of course, because we are talking about groundwater. And this groundwater model should be built by using the equations that we already studied, because we studied the groundwater flow equation. In particular, we have to take into account Darcy's law and uh, permeability. Permeability, so hydraulic conductivity, the K parameter of Darcy's law. This brings to me the opportunity to remind you that we studied this equation and. Uh, to remind you, I will make a recap next Thursday with the possible questions that I may ask at the exam. But for sure, one possible question is the groundwater flow equation and thus is low. So this gives to me the opportunity to remind to you that this is extremely important in when we talk about water source systems. OK. And you remember that um, in, um, when we developed the groundwater flow equation, we made an assumption which is uh, already part, which is also part of Darcy's law. The assumption is that the hydraulic head, which means the energy of a fluid particle, in this case moving one, is uh, given by two components. One is position and the other is pressure. So we said if we want to call the hydraulic head with the capital H symbol, we said hydraulic head is given by a position term, which is the elevation with respect to a reference level, plus pressure divided by specific weight. This is the hydraulic head of a fluid particle. And if you think of fluid mechanics, you may remember that fluid mechanics talks about a third term for the energy of a fluid. The third term is a kinetic term. There is velocity in there. But in the, when talking about groundwater, we ignore it because groundwater is moving very slowly. And therefore, we assume that the hydraulic head is given by just the sum of a position term and a pressure term. Good. Mm. Now, this uh, this uh, expression for giving the energy of a fluid particle can be used also in static conditions if the particle is, is, uh, doesn't move, is fixed, doesn't move. So when we talk about this fluid particle here, we have uh, basically um, two terms that contribute to its energy, which are Elevation with respect to reference level and position. And sorry, and, and uh, pressure. Mm. Okay. You may also remember 
that in static conditions, for instance, when we refer to a tank, what I'm saying is not immediately relevant for, for determining uh, the position of this uh, interface, but I think it's useful that I remember. When we talk about hydrostatics, uh, for instance, uh, a glass of water, and uh, we consider a fluid particle in, in a glass of water, we may indicate with respect to the reference level, which is maybe the bottle level of the glass, Z. And, uh, and then we have here pressure term. Pressure term. OK. And so we may talk about energy of this fluid particle by summing Z and the pressure term. What is the value of the pressure term? And the pressure here is given, in this case, uh, where we have a free surface here, is given by the weight of water that is above the particle. It's just that. If we don't have anything else that is making pressure, like a pump or something, here we have a column of water that is sitting above here, and uh, column of water, and the weight of this column of water gives the pressure and uh, we can say if we indicate with h uh, the height of water above the particle we can say that e is uh, equal to h divide, um, sorry uh, gamma h where gamma is a specific weight for unit, because the particle has an infinitesimal section, so for unit surface, the weight of the column of water is given by h, which is the depth of the particle, so the height of the column of water above the particle, times gamma. So, the hydraulic head is given by Z plus P divided by gamma, which is equal to Z plus gamma H divided by gamma, which is Z plus H. And given that the free surface is horizontal, like the reference plane, we measure elevation from, which must be horizontal by definition, because elevation is measured with respect to a horizontal level. What we, what we get from here is that H is constant. And it's equivalent to the water height into the glass. And this is uh, what I derived here. I derived the hydrostatic flow. Why it is useful? Why this reasoning is useful for this application? It is useful because I clarify that the pressure is equivalent to gamma H. OK. So let's study this particle. This particle is subjected to two pressures. The pressure of salt water and the pressure of, of fresh water. So 
What is the pressure of salt water? Actually, now I, I realize uh, I realize that it's useful for me to have the splash line back. So apologize for this. And if you deleted it, please put it back. The pressure of salt water is given by, let me indicate with capital H, the elevation of uh, salt water above the particle. This is uh, the pressure of salt water. You see that salt water tends to raise this particle if, uh, because salt water acts uh, with this pressure, tends to raise it. And uh, what does it mean, raising this particle? It means uh, salt water intrusion. So, also, it's very physical. It's very understandable what happens. OK. Now, the pressure of, uh, of uh, uh, fresh water. Let me indicate with uh, the symbol HF, the height of fresh water over the particle. And let me indicate with H, lowercase h, the elevation of fresh water above sea level. Now we are ready to compute the pressures, the two pressures of uh, fresh water. You see that fresh water wants <coughs> to push the particle back because fresh water wants to get into the sea. OK, now we are ready to compute the equilibrium, the condition for equilibrium. So let me go on the other blackboard. I delete uh, here the sketch of the hydrostatic law. Look, I like teaching on the blackboard very much. It requires more preparation on my side because I need to, uh, to get prepared in advance. But it is, I think it is uh, more creative and involves the students more. The problem is that in order to be uh, uh, useful, I need a large blackboard. I think that this, the surface of this blackboard is the limit. When we go in the 1.5, the blackboard is too small. Even if I, I, I put the, the screen up, uh, I tried in the past, but it is a continuously writing and erasing, writing and erasing, which means uh, that it's difficult for the student to follow. And this is why, and uh, also, um, there is another reason that I tell you. This is why, at least in the other row, I tend to use uh, the slides. Uh, also, there is another reason why I, I am uh, using with you more the slides than uh, the blackboard, which is not very relevant. But the reason is that when I realize that when I teach in English, it's more difficult for me to use the blackboard because uh, it requires an effort to use the blackboard. It requires an effort to speak in English. The sum of the two efforts sometimes makes my efficiency in teaching, this is my perception, lower. And therefore, this is the second reason. But uh, still, I think I am really enjoying today that I am using the blackboard. Anyway, this is uh, something that I want to point out. So let's start in the pressure. It's very easy. Because uh, if the particle doesn't move, it means that, let me use the y, it means that gamma s times h is equal to gamma, gamma and, and that's it, h f, lowercase h f. This is what happens. So you see that if you increase, uh, if you increase, uh, for instance, sea level, then the particle goes up. And that's it. Okay, let's, but let's study with more detail here. And uh, 
because I want to get uh, um, uh, explicit representation for for H. Okay, so let me write this relationship in this way. Gamma S H is equal to gamma capital H plus lowercase h. HF is given by capital H plus lowercase h. Good. Now, I can write that gamma S multiplied by capital H is equal to gamma which multiplies capital H plus gamma which multiplies lowercase h. Okay, so I can write in this way h which multiplies gamma s minus gamma is equal to gamma lower h, which means h, bh, is equal to gamma lower divided by gamma s minus gamma h, small h. This is my expression. OK, remember that lower h is elevation of fresh water above sea level. OK, good. Now, what is the value of this coefficient? Let me call it alpha. Uh, gamma is 1,000. What is the value of gamma s minus gamma? It's about 25. 1,000 divided 25 is about 40. So we can write here that big H is more or less 40 lower H. Which is interesting. It is interesting because what is capital H. Capital H is the depth of salt water. It means that if fresh water increases its elevation one meter over the sea level, it pushes back in depth salt water 40 meters, which is good to know. One may say, okay, this is good to know because it means that uh, with a smaller elevation of fresh water, I can keep salt water back, which is uh, something understandable because if you think uh, this fresh water has to flow to the sea if it is at a higher level, and therefore it's understandable that in this way, there is, uh, uh, with, with an elevation of fresh water, there is uh, uh, a strong action in terms of pushing back salt water. On the other hand, this relationship, this relationship highlights a real concern. If you, with a human impact, lower fresh water even of 50 centimeters, you get a raise of salt water that is 40 times larger, which means that I give you an example. Let's suppose that like it happens, people here, they use a well to get, uh, I'm sorry because the slide is interfers with, let me draw it in another position, let me draw it here. Suppose that people dig a well in order to get fresh water. And of course, they don't go very deep because they know that at a certain depth there is salt water. So they don't go very deep. But then they start taking water. And you know that the effect of a well over the level of fresh water is like this when it works. When it works, 
it causes a decrease of the level of fresh water, a local decrease. But this local decrease means that you have a corresponding local increase of salt water, which can get into the well, and the well becomes useless. And once that a well gets contaminated, to remedy it is very difficult. So in making this example, I highlighted uh, what is one of the main drivers of salt water intrusion. It's fresh water abstraction. Fresh water abstraction is a main driver of salt water intrusion. We don't have to exaggerate in abstracting fresh water. If we exaggerate, we contaminate the wells. And uh, sometimes we realize it when it's too late. What is uh, a positive consideration? Actually, the separation, as I said, between salt water and fresh water is not a line. It's uh, a zone. So the, we have the opportunity to realize that salinity in the well is uh, increasing. It doesn't become immediately salted. If we monitor the well while we abstract water, and we realize that salinity is increasing, and we realize it on time, we can stop getting water. And in some cases, administration react by flushing water into the well. So they monitor the well. If they realize that salinity is increasing, they reduce the abstraction, and they monitor what happens. But if they feel that the situation is already compromised and needs to be remediated, one urgent action could be to release fresh water into the well, thus cleaning, raising the fresh water level, and therefore cleaning the soil in the proximity of the well. So I gave an example of a first driver, which is indeed relevant. This is what usually happens, that people take too much water, and therefore salinity increases. And an example of a possible remediation strategy, water injection, fresh, fresh water injection. It's a possible remediation strategy. There are other drivers. Other drivers that uh, I would like to briefly discuss with you alongside with uh, possible remediation strategies. So what could be other drivers? Of course, uh, other drivers may be any action, any event, which may be natural or human-induced, that compromises this equilibrium. By far, groundwater abstraction is uh, the main driver. And I give you an example. In the coast area close by here on the Adriatic Sea, you know that it's an area where tourism is extremely important. And uh, it's extremely important for, for the income that tourist, uh, tourism brings. And the tourism in that area started relatively recently. If you go back uh, 60 years from now, and 1960, for instance, tourism was almost zero in that area. It, it was almost a natural area, also not really sane, because there were marshes, uh, and, uh, and it, it was not a healthy area. But then tourism increased, and water abstraction has increased a lot. And this has caused salt water intrusion. And they reacted by building the aqueduct of the Romania region, which through, by means of a dam that is located in the mountains, they bring fresh water from the mountains to the coastal <coughs> areas, so reducing groundwater abstraction. And this was a reaction to the increase of salinity in drinkable water that they used to take from the wells, which uh, uh, made uh, um, a substantial risk of compromising the tourism in the region. So it was a urgent issue. What 
can be other drivers. Okay, drivers can be classified, and uh, in my web page they are classified depending on the scale. And the, we have drivers at the global scale, drivers at the regional scale, drivers at the local scale. So drivers at the global scale are, first of all, climate change, of course, because uh, if you have a reduction of rainfall and a sea level rise, you know that climate change uh, is causing sea level rise. We studied it. It's a rise that is about, uh, we, we are talking about 50, 20 centimeters since the pre-industrial period. But if you look here, it, it's, uh, you need to compensate it, you need uh, uh, anyway, a uh, uh, rise of fresh water. If climate change is impacting rainfall and therefore infiltration, we have to also consider that. This is less clear. It's not clear in terms of average rainfall, climate change is not really impacting. So, I mean, it's, it's uh, probably it's not very significant. Sea level rise is something that it's, uh, it's uh, is measured and it's, uh, we know quite well what is the impact. So climate change is a first time. And uh, at the regional, I would say, let me see, let me see if I'm not forgetting anything. Okay, and uh, I, I, I would say that um, at, uh, another driver is, uh, climate variability, of course, uh, because uh, if you look back at uh, climate change, uh, as we have seen, it's a term that usually identifies anthropogenic changes in climate. Climate variability is also a driver, and this is natural. Then let's go at the regional scale. At the regional scale, uh, tornadoes and hurricanes uh, and tsunamis uh, are a relevant driver because, for instance, uh, the tsunami that occurred in 2006 is I well, remember in Sri Lanka caused the deep contamination of groundwater. And this was one of the most concerning consequences because people there that were hit by the tsunami didn't have any more opportunity for getting fresh water because the well got all contaminated. This was a big impact. In fact, there was a, a international support to study remediation strategies for these wells. And, uh, Tsunami are, of course, relevant because they cause a big wave that is entering into the land. The same thing may happen with tornadoes or hurricanes, and these are usually uh, regional scale drivers. Another very important regional scale driver, which is partly natural, partly human in use, is land subsidence, land compaction. Because land compaction, the, the causes changes, reduction in the altitude of the land that is of the same order of magnitude and in most cases higher than sea level rise. For instance, here in this region, land compaction for natural causes, because it's a natural process, it's extremely relevant and much more relevant than sea level rise. And, uh, Land compaction may also be induced by groundwater withdrawal, so human impact, and extraction of gases on the, or oil and gases. So oil and gas extraction causes land compaction. And here we have a combination of the two. There is a natural process. A natural process because uh, this is uh, alluvial material. The alluvial material is naturally subjected to compaction, and therefore to lowering. And this is something that is extremely relevant more than sea level rise, as I said. And this is regional. Also, at the regional level, urbanization. Urbanization, which means uh, paved areas, means reduction of infiltration and may have an impact on the groundwater level. Urbanization is effective at the regional level, but also at the local level. And uh, for instance, here, what happened in the coast of the Adriatic Sea is also that urbanization uh, caused a reduction of infiltration. A reduction of infiltration, of course, uh, causes uh, a reduction of the level of fresh water. Also, when you have modification of the beach, uh, it's also something that can be effective 
for instance, uh, if people remove dunes, dunes uh, are uh, another barrier to saltwater intrusion because they host fresh water. And uh, at an elevation that is significant because the height of a dune may be like uh, six, uh, seven meters, eight meters. And, and therefore, it's a considerable barrier because uh, the presence of fresh water is like a barrier to saltwater intrusion. Let me see if I forgot. Uh, droughts. Droughts are a regional, regional driver. Droughts, of course, mean lowering of, uh, of uh, fresh water. And droughts can be caused by climate change, uh, but uh, can also be natural processes. Uh, but a drought, uh, even a single one, may be very significant. Because as I said, once that we got fresh water intrusion, then, uh, then uh, it is a problem. Uh, salt water intrusion, sorry. And um, yeah. Uh, at the local level, land drainage is another driver. And we use uh, to drain the land uh, to make uh, the land uh, more, sub more prone uh, to human settlements. And, uh, but on the other end, uh, on the other end, uh, we don't want marshes, for instance. But on the other hand, draining the land means reducing infiltration, of course, because if water stays on the land for a longer time, then there is more infiltration. If we drain the land in order to get, for instance, feed for agricultural production, if we drain the land, then there is a reduction of infiltration and a reduction of groundwater level. Okay, I think uh, I listed uh, all the um, main drivers. Now let's talk about remediation. First of all, remediation, what is remediation? Is uh, a set of actions to clean the land, the soil that, is, that has been contaminated by salt water. An essential requirement for a remediation strategy is monitoring. I already mentioned it. Monitoring means measuring salinity in wells and rivers. Let's not forget rivers. Well, one may say, why rivers? Because I'm not taking drinkable water from rivers and also water for irrigation. We don't take much, it f much from rivers. But the problem is that the river is feeding the groundwater. The river is a supply of fresh water to groundwater systems if the river gets salted. And not to speak about the ecological, ecologic equilibrium, which is also important because you know that uh, ecosystems are extremely important for environmental protection and remediation. So we have to monitor wells and rivers. And monitoring has the purpose of checking that nothing changes significantly with respect to the status quo. We may realize sometime that the density of wells is not sufficient to ensure an efficient monitoring because we don't have a well every, we don't have thousands of wells. Therefore, a strategy for monitoring is to use piezometers. Piezometers are very small wells. You push a pipe into the soil, a pipe of reduced section, until you reach the level of groundwater. And this gives an opportunity for monitoring groundwater level and salinity. Because, of course, uh, you can get fresh water from the pipe, a small sample of fresh water, and then we can measure salinity. So it's important that the density, if the density of the wells is not, uh, not sufficient, it's important that we project monitoring networks. And there are dedicated methodology for designing monitoring networks. 
In my slides I gave, uh, on a, I, I pasted a couple of pictures uh, that are related to the monitoring activities on the Adriatic coast, uh, which are carried out by the Regional Agency for Environmental Protection. It's an interesting example. And uh, in the slides and the web page I pasted just a, a screenshot, but you can visit the site if you're interested and you can see the level of salinity in real time in the monitoring points. Okay, so what are the possible strategies? I already talked about freshwater injection and another possible strategy is building artificial barriers, which means that like building walls in the ground of reduced permeability. So you can create these barriers with concrete or with clay. The, the idea is to impede saltwater intrusion by means of a layer of reduced permeability. This is extremely, of course, demanding in terms of, uh, of uh, costs, in terms of resources, and also, we have to carefully consider the environmental, the environmental impact because uh, we are also stacking uh, fresh water there. And, and therefore, we change the circulation of groundwater in a way that can be not really desirable. But this is a possibility. And uh, let me see the list of remediation strategies. So I'm sure not to forget anything that I'm treating here. <coughs> Another strategy, which is uh, which is um, 